that there were some people walking alongside Rasulullah that he himself did not know were munafiqun. They were walking with him, they were eating with him, they were talking with him. But Rasulullah, Allah tells him, you do not know who they are. We know. We will punish them double the punishment. And that's why many historians, when they examine the definition of the term companion, they see many a contradiction in this term. Why? Because when a person comes to see the actions of some of those who were meant to be close to Rasulullah after he died, a person comes forward and then asks, how could they be called companions? For example, after Rasulullah died, you find that there was an event that was known as the Saqifah. And that the Saqifah was an election that took place while Rasulullah was being buried. And that in this election, there was an important point that was mentioned by the first and the second Khalifa. When they were at the election, they said to the Ansar, the people of Medina, they said, we are the Muhajirun, you are the Ansar. We have a greater right for leadership than you do. Here, one definition was brought out, that the Muhajirun of the companions had a greater right to authority than the Ansar, which highlighted that the Muhajirun had a greater status than the Ansar. Then when the second Khalifa was dying, another definition of companion emerged, which was what? When the second Khalifa was dying, he said there will be a shura of six people. And these six people will choose the Khalifa after me. Who were they? Ali, Uthman, Talha, Zubair, Sa'ad, and Abdul Rahman. The second Khalifa said these six companions will choose the leader after me. And then historians came forward and asked the question, does that mean these six companions are greater than all the other companions? Because the question was raised, why weren't the other companions allowed to come and vote in this election? Why was it done behind closed doors with only six people? And then another of the historians came forward and said that if all Muhammad's companions were so loyal to him, then why is it that in the battle of Jamal, on one side of the army, Aisha, Talha and Zubair are fighting the other side of the army, Ammar ibn Yasir and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Many came forward and said that if you are all great companions of Muhammad and you are all loyal towards him, how comes you are fighting each other in the battle of Jamal? And then another historian came and said that the same argument again is weak, that all the companions are meant to be loyal because in Safin, Many of the so-called Sahaba of Rasulullah were again fighting each other. That on one side of the army, Muawiyah, who was seen as a Sahabi, Amr ibn al-As, who was seen as a Sahabi, was fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was seen as a Sahabi. And therefore again, there was a need to seek a definition of what makes a companion. Because it seemed all wishy-washy when it came to these wars, that on one side of the army, you have people who are called great companions, and another side of the army, you have people who are called great companions, yet they are all fighting each other, one against the other. Therefore, when we come as historians to examine this issue, of the utmost importance is that we examine it without prejudice. Because when a person examines an issue with prejudice and with emotion, we will go nowhere. Just because I was brought up believing certain personalities are great, does not mean I do not scrutinize their actions. Every human being in history has to be scrutinized in order that we are able to learn from their actions. Likewise with the Sahaba of Rasulullah, we have to examine them. Why? Because these are the people who built the foundations of the religion of Islam. These are the people who fought in Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar and Hunayn and Tabuk. These are the people who saw Rasulullah and they ate with Rasulullah and they came forward and prayed behind Rasulullah. Therefore, it is vital that we study them in order that we are able to take from the examples of their life and apply it into our own life. Likewise, we should not come with any bias that when we study them, we study them neutrally. Each of the companions we study for his own merit. And then we come forward with a definition in order to understand why was there so much civil war after Rasulullah died? Why did many of his companions kill each other? that over 30,000 companions were killed and were killing each other after Rasulullah died. Without us understanding what is the definition of a Sahaba, we will never understand what constitutes the Sahaba of our 12th Imam. Why? Because what constitutes the Sahaba of our first 
will constitute the Sahaba of our last. Therefore, when you come to this verse and examine it, the verse has a number of examinations. For this verse sought to define for us what is the meaning of a true Sahabi. When you look at the verse, what does it say? The verse begins with the statement, Muhammadun Rasulullah. The first line. Is that Muhammad is the messenger of God. The first question to be asked is, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin a verse which defines companions with what is seemingly a very obvious statement? We all know that Rasulullah is the messenger of God. But why does Allah seek to define the companions by beginning the verse by making the statement? Number one. Number two. Those who are with him are firm against the disbelievers. Number three. Ruhama baynahum. But they are merciful between themselves. Number four. تَرَاهُمْ رُكَّعًا سُجَّدًا يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهُهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ You find them always in ruku' and in sujood, receiving God's sustenance. And there are marks of sujood on their forehead. Number five, ذَلِكَ مَثَلُهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَمَثَلُهُمْ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ Their example is in the Torah and their example is in the Injil. Kazar'in, like the example of a plant. Kazar'in akhraja, like the example of a plant which puts forward its seeds, and this seed becomes a stalk, which then becomes what? A stem. Why did Allah make the similitude of Rasulullah's companions like a plant which grows? When we examine each of these areas, we will understand what truly constitutes a person who is called a Sahabi of Rasulullah. Let us go step by step. Number one, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin the verse Muhammadun Rasulullah? We all know that Rasulullah is the Prophet of God, is the Messenger of God. But why does Allah begin with Muhammadun Rasulullah? The reason is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when defining what a companion is, wanted to tell us that a true companion is one who unconditionally submits to the Risala of Rasulullah. And the idea that Rasulullah in Islam is not seen as being a lawgiver. Rather, he is, being a, he is seen as simply being an announcer of law, not a lawgiver. There are some people who believe that when Rasulullah came to Arabia, he came to be a lawgiver. Whereas in Islam, we do not believe Rasulullah is a lawgiver. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only lawgiver. Rasulullah came to announce Allah's law only. He came to make clear what Allah's law is. Rasulullah, Ahlul Bayt cannot make law. Laws only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore taking this on board, when the Quran said Muhammadun Rasulullah, the Quran was trying to say what? That a true companion of Rasulullah when he knows Rasulullah has come with a risala, would never question any of the risala of Rasulullah. You see, because there were people who used to be around Rasulullah, like we wish we could have been. And when you think about yourself, if you had been alongside Rasulullah, would you have ever questioned the mouth of Rasulullah? Because if I know that he is receiving a risala from the heavens, I know therefore that he is not making it from himself. He is bringing a risala from the heavens to the people of the earth. He is simply a postman who brings the risala. That's why the Quran, when it describes Rasulullah, it says that never ever question what Rasulullah brings you. For example, the verse in the Quran which came and said, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Rasulullah does not speak of his own will. He speaks of revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The idea was that when Rasulullah comes and tells you pray, he isn't the one who's made the law to pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's made the law to pray. When Rasulullah comes and tells you give zakat, he is not the one who's making the law. The law is from Allah. He is simply announcing to you to make the law. And the reality was that a true companion of Rasulullah would know that.